My name is Kai Burridge, and I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of, of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in 2007. I want to thank Shelby for her steadfast support for the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. I also want to remind everyone that proof of vaccination is required to attend this event. <laughs> but seriously, 18 months into this pandemic, I hope everyone is staying safe. And while the Graduate Center at CUNY is now open for classes, we are not allowed to hold any public events in the auditorium. Uh, so this autumn, this autumn semester, all our Leon Levy events will be on Zoom. Please note that our next event will be on September 14th at 5 p.m. when our associate director, Thad Zilkowski, will be interviewing Frances Wilson about her new biography, Burning Man, The Trials of D.H. Lawrence. Please mark your calendars and register for this free event on the Leon Levy website. Note that we have at least 10 events this autumn, a very full schedule. So please encourage your friends and relatives to subscribe to our digital mailing list on our website. It's very easy to do. But tonight we are here to celebrate a new biography by one of our own former Leon Levy fellows, Rebecca Donner. She will be in conversation with Ruth Franklin. Please look for Rebecca's extraordinary book, All the Frequent Troubles of Our Days at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. Rebecca Donner was a 2018-19 fellow at the Leon Levy Center. She is a two-time Yaddo Fellow and has twice been awarded fellowships by the Ucross Foundation. In addition to all the trouble of our days, she is the author of Burnout, a graphic novel about eco-terrorism, and Sunset Terrace, a critically acclaimed novel. Her essays, reportage, and reviews have appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times and Book Forum. Born in Canada, she was educated at the University of California, Berkeley and Columbia University. And she has taught at Wesleyan, Barnard and Columbia University. Uh, former Leon Levy fellow, Ruth Franklin is a book critic and former editor at the New Republic. Her first biography, Shirley Jackson, A Rather Haunted Life was published by Norton in 2016 and won the National Book Critics Circle Award for biography. It was also named a New York Times Notable Book of 2016, a Time Magazine top nonfiction book for that year, and a Best Book of 2016 by the Boston Globe, the San Francisco Chronicle, NPR, and others. She is a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in Biography, a Coleman Fellowship at the New York Public Library, and the Roger Shattuck Prize for Criticism. She lives, as does Rebecca, in Brooklyn. Rebecca and Ruth will be in conversation for about 40 minutes, and then they will take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the question box below to type in your questions, and Ruth will be sure to get to as many as she can. We will try to end this program after one hour. Again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. And now I turn this conversation over to Ruth Franklin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kai. Um, it's such a privilege to be here, uh, to be with you, Rebecca, talking about um, this extraordinary book you've written. Since we're both biographers and this is an event sponsored by the Levy Foundation, um, I'm hoping that our conversation can focus uh, on, the on some questions of process in terms of exactly how you went about writing this book, what kinds of research you did, um, course, the actual writing and putting it all together. Um, maybe the hardest part. I don't know. We can talk about that, that too. But um, let's start off just by giving the audience um, a little bit of background on the book. So this is the story of Mildred Harnack, your great, great aunt, um, who was, had a unique position as an American woman in the German resistance, correct? Um, and so maybe you could just start by talking a little bit about Harnack in your family and how you came to her story. 
Absolutely. Um, I'm hearing an echo. I'm wondering if everybody has their themselves muted. Did you hear that? Yeah, I heard an echo when I was talking too. Okay, now it sounds better. How is my audio? Okay. Okay. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah, please, do, please mute yourselves. If, if you are not muted, please be sure to keep yourselves on mute yes. um, while we're talking. Thank you. Yeah, take it away. Thank you. Ruth, it's just, it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to be here um, with you. Um, I have admired your work uh, for quite a while. And, and so this is just an absolute joy to um, appear in conversation with you. And thank you, Kai Bird and the Leon Levy Center for Biography as well. I have a debt of gratitude. Um, I think, yes, so uh, an introduction, um, I can simply just read from the introduction of my book. And uh, this will give all of you uh, who aren't acquainted with my book a, a good um, general idea of both my narrative approach, um, my, my narrative strategy, uh, and also um, uh, the content of the book. Introduction. Her aim was self-erasure. The more invisible she was, the better her chances of survival. In her journal, she noted what she ate, read, thought. The first was on controversy. The second and third were not. For this reason, she hid the journal when she suspected the so closing in on her. I, okay, it. so I got a message just like now. It. it says you are muted, and but when I go here, um, should I just keep reading? Audio. Somebody is talking right now. Could you just make sure that and everybody out there mute yourselves? Yeah, right in the lower left-hand corner, it says mute. Click that button. Thank you. Um, okay, so. Mildred has just been a journal. She was at the harrowing center of the German resistance, but she wasn't German, nor was she Polish or French. She was American, mm -hmm. conspicuously so. Okay. The men she recruited acquired mm -hmm. code names, armless, beamer, worker. She appeared under no code name. Still, she was- Is this local? It's from The nature of her work required absolute secrecy. She didn't dare tell her family. Okay, so you can't get audio. That's the way the Midwest. They remained bewildered that she, at 26, had jumped aboard a steamer trip, ship and crossed the Atlantic, leaving behind everyone she loved. Her family is my family. Three generations separate us. She preferred anonymity, so I will whisper her name. Mildred Arnott. In 1932, she held her first clandestine meeting in her apartment. A small band of political activists that grew into the largest underground resistance group in Berlin by the end of the decade. During the Second World War, her group collaborated with a Soviet espionage network that conspired mm -hmm. to defeat Hitler, employing agents and operatives in Paris, Geneva, Brussels, and Berlin. In the fall of 1942, the Gestapo pounced. She was thrown in prison. So were her co-conspirators. During a hastily convened trial at the Reichskriegsgericht, the Reich Court Martial, a prosecutor who'd earned the moniker Hitler's bloodhound hammered them with questions. She sat on a wooden chair in the back of the courtroom. Other chairs held high-ranking Nazi officers. At the center of the room sat a panel of five judges. Everyone there was German except her. When it was her turn, she approached the stand. She was emaciated, her lungs ravaged by tuberculosis she'd contracted in prison. How long she stood there remains unknown. Surviving documents don't note the time the prosecutor began questioning her or the time he stopped. What is known is this. The answers she gave him were lies, real whoppers. The judges believed her. The sentence she received was considered mild, six years of hard labor in a prison camp. Two days later, Hitler overrode the verdict and ordered her execution. On February 16, 1943, she was strapped to a guillotine and beheaded. I'm gonna skip over just a little bit and I'm going to end on the last page of the introduction. Despite her wish to remain invisible, 
she left a trail for us to follow. Along the trail are official documents, British, US, and Soviet era intelligence files, thick of British, US, and Soviet era intelligence files, thick as your wrist. Then there are the unofficial documents, which reveal deeper truths. The letters she wrote, the letters other people wrote to her and about her. Family and friends left behind notes, date books, diaries, photographs, testimonials. It can't be said that there was a consensus about the woman they knew or thought they knew. To many, she was an enigma, inspiring a range of contradictory conclusions about who she was and why she did what she did. Nearly all the people knew her are lost to history. Those who are still alive are well into their 90s. One I hope to find more than any other. He was just a boy when he met Mildred, young enough to be her son. I tracked him down and implored him. What did she tell you? How did she enter a room? Did you hear her weep, sing? Did she trust you? Wonderful. So part of the reason I suggested that you read is that I wanted um, those who are listening to be able to hear the fantastic immediacy of that, that your text has. It's, you know, you, you have a lot of first person narration. Um, you're very intimately situating yourself as the narrator, sometimes inside, um, inside the heads Sorry, I got Rebecca. Are you can you unmute? <laughs> Sorry, everyone. We seem to be having technological challenges. Today, yes, so we let's are. Just carry on. We're gonna get past um, this. I know we are. <laughs> anyway, that would be um, immediately with which you with which you inhabit um, the minds of all of these figures um, strikes me as an ironic contrast to the awkwardness with which we are negotiating our, our you know, supposedly helpful modern technology. Um, but so a part of, I wonder, so part of the reason I want to talk about, um, you know, the different um, methods you use to achieve that effect. But yes. um, starting off, you know, Mildred Harnack was your your relative, right? And I'm curious right. about you know your your emotional engagement with her as a member of your family, um, and um, you know what what was her role like in your in in your family as you were growing up? Um, what did you know about 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 her story? Well, I I was aware of her as a kind of presence around me when I was growing up. Um, I've uh, I. I told this story a few times, um, but I, I basically first uh, saw or was aware of her, first heard her uh, name uttered in my presence when I was about nine and I was visiting my great grandmother in Chevy Chase, Maryland. And, uh, and she was measuring my height and she put a ruler on my head and made a mark on the wall. And then I stood back and looked at all the other marks on the wall. And, and, and I saw a very faint mark and, and with an M next to it. And I, and I asked her, oh, who's that? And she said, why that's Mildred. And she, there was a kind of hardness to her voice. And I think that the mystery began for me right then. I, I had the sense even at the age of nine that there was more to the story. And, um, and when I was 16, my grandmother gave me Mildred's letters and then she made a big bundle. Uh, 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 actually, I have the binder right here, but she made copies. So there's just this massive binder of letters. And, um, <laughs> and so I, uh, and, and she knew that I had ambitions to be a writer and that I wanted to write great books. And she thought that the subject of Mildred Harnock would merit a, a great big book. And so she uh, asked me um, to write about her one day. And, so I took that to heart, um, but and she also told me stories about Mildred at the time, and and I was old enough then for her to tell me about her, her death, um, and 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 about her involvement in the resistance, um, and so, I that 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 was sort of she was, uh, in in 
I, I felt her presence, as I said earlier, sort of around me and, and I would go to family reunions and there would be a mention of Mildred and somebody would tell an anecdote. Uh, but I was also very aware that there were a lot of holes in the story. Um, and, and so, um, and family members who didn't attend those, those reunions. And so I thought, well, at some point I'm gonna have to track them down and, and ask them what they know. And, um, and, and so um, those were sort of the, the, the early, uh, the beginnings of the process of thinking about this book. Um, and I can speak more about then sort of the process, the, then as I, I published two books and I thought that the whole, I, I knew that one day I would embark upon this project and but I, I wanted to make sure that I was ready to um, do the heavy lift. And, uh, and, and it was my intention, not only to draw on those letters uh, that Mildred had written her family, uh, but also to do extensive archival document, uh, find our archival documents and do extensive archival research in not only the US and the Library of Congress and the National Archives and, uh, and, and in Wisconsin, there's a great deal of information about her, uh, but also um, in uh, espionage files in Moscow and um, in, in London in the National Archive and, and, um, and also in, in Germany. So I did visit after my second book was published, I, I visited the Gedenkstätte Deutsche Widerstand in, in Berlin and I spoke with um, the director there and asked him if I could have access to documents, uh, many of which my, my grandmother had actually given uh, the, the, the center. Um, and, um, and so I, then I began the process of really starting to go through archival documents and, and getting a, a, a better sense both of uh, what we know and also what we don't know. Yeah, I was, so I wanna dig more deeply into that for sure. But first of all, you decided to tell not only Mildred's story, um, but the larger story of World War II in Germany and the resistance, um, kind of what we need to know in order to really appreciate who she was and what she was fighting against. And so your book includes a kind of pocket history of Nazi Germany, um, starting with Hitler being elected chancellor, continuing through the Reichstag fire, the book burning, the night of the long knives, you know, the Nuremberg laws, Kristallnacht. Yeah. So these are events obviously that will be familiar to many readers. Uh, why did you choose to take this kind of broad approach rather than as a more conventional bi biographer would do, focusing on Mildred more narrowly? I felt that the context was uh, essential to understand if we were to understand more about who Mildred was and if the task of the biographer is to try to understand the person uh, we're studying, I, I, I couldn't I, look at her in isolation. I had to look at her in the context um, of uh, where she was. And, 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 and in order to do that, I needed to not only show what um, fascist Germany looked like, uh, but also how, uh, how Germany came to be a fascist dictatorship. And as I began to research um, this book and, and, and it really, again, started with the letters, which were for me, the, the portal into Mildred's heart and mind. I started, uh, the, the letters started in the late twenties and she moved to, to Germany in 1929. And so um, uh, she, writes to her mother about her experience in, this is during the Weimar era, and this is a time when actually there, there is a constitution and there's freedom of speech and freedom of um, religion and freedom of the press. There are 90 daily newspapers in Berlin alone during this time that represent every possible political view from the extreme left to the extreme right. And, and Mildred was astonished by just going, the, the experience of sitting in the U-Bahn and seeing everyone reading. Uh, and, and, I, and, and also she remarked on just this explosion of, um, in the arts. She also remarked on um, the other aspects of uh, German society. And very quickly she became appalled by the spectacle of swastikas everywhere. And, uh, and, and sh this was not the Germany that she anticipated that she would be arriving in. Um, she moved there to pursue her PhD and she met her German husband there whom she had met in graduate school at the University of, of Wisconsin. Um, 
but uh, she intended to get her PhD and, and, um, and with her husband lead a quiet academic life teaching at, a, at the University of Berlin um, or another university in Germany and, and, and then maybe alternate with another uh, university in the United States. And, um, but their, their, her vision for herself uh, is certainly, um, she very quickly abandoned it when she saw that, that she needed to, as she put it in a letter, do something about this. And so um, she, she began holding meetings in her Berlin apartment and, um, and Arvid as well. And they invited friends and friends of friends and students. And, and, and that was the beginning of, and that was in 1932, a year before Hitler was appointed chancellor. So, um, I, uh, and, and then once, once he did um, become chancellor, then, I wanted to show the reader um, how swiftly Germany progressed from a parliamentary democracy to a fascist dictatorship. And I, I, I think one thing that I have heard from readers over and over again, uh, readers who write to me, uh, who have read the book um, and, and uh, given it a lot of thought, many of them say they, they had no idea it happened this quickly. Um, and, and so I wanted to show that, again, going back to your question, Ruth, I wanted to give the reader the context. And, um, and, and it, is, it is a history lesson, which I think we need in this day and age. And, and, um, and so I also made that artistic choice to write the book in the present tense, because I felt that for the reader to sense the immediacy of, of this and to also experience um, for themselves, uh, as, um, how quickly this happened. I, I needed to write it in the present tense, so uh, so as not to distance the reader from the events. You know, you, you write something in the past tense, and already there's this sense of a remove uh, and a sense of a kind of a sepia-toned history. And and I wanted uh, this book to sort of to 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 seem as if it were in full color and, and happening right now. And for the reader to have a visceral, vivid experience of, of, uh, of that progression from a parliamentary democracy to a fascist dictatorship. Yeah, I think you really do achieve that, that visceral feeling of it. it. It is almost as if we are watching the events, you know, these events that we know so well intellectually, but we don't know what it felt like to be in Germany and watch it all unfold. And it really does feel to the reader as if you're seeing it through Mildred's eyes and experiencing the things that she would have experienced, you know, what she would have read in the newspaper or the signs she might've seen on the street or, you know, what she could and couldn't buy in the store. It all contributes to a very visceral and vivid and personal sense of, um, you know, what it might've really been like to live in Hitler's Germany. Yeah. Um, so tell me about um, what are some of the biggest surprises that you encountered during your research? And I wonder also if there were some near misses. I remember um, the, a few years ago, you were very, very avidly searching for um, what I had, what I first heard from you about as the Corsican file, which is oh, yes. like, um, such a mysterious and <laughs> romantic <laughs> thing to be looking for in the KGB <laughs> archives. Yeah. And, um, I could not but wonder if you ever, if you, you know, kudos to you that you worked so hard to try to turn over every stone. I could not but wonder if you finally found what you were looking for in that, right. in that Corsican file, or, you know, there are other things that, uh, you know, I think all of us have, you know, some kind of, kind of spectacular finds, but also, you know, our, our wistfulness over the stuff that got. Oh, yes. Well, I, the Corsican file, okay, it sounds, right. it sounds like a, like a Netflix series, you know, um, and I, I, uh, I, yes, I was dogged in my search for the Corsican file. Um, I, I the, the first time that, that it had been written about in the context of Mildred Harnock was um, in Shrine Blair Brysak's uh, biography, uh, Resisting Hitler. And it, it was, um, she really, uh, it was an incredible discovery. And she was, she basically was, uh, as I understand it, um, in communication with um, Sarah, Sarah and Costello, um, who wrote a book called Deadly Illusions, uh, and basically um, summarizing and, and describing uh, these files, among other among other espionage files, for a minute in the in the mid nineties, um, the um, uh, 
Russia opened up some Soviet uh, era intelligence files um, and, and allowed certain people to have a, a glimpse. It was a tightly controlled um, uh, action, and 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 then you know, and then they slammed shut again, and they're under lock and key. Uh, I knew this very well, but I still was determined. I, I thought, well, um, you know. Uh, Maybe somebody, maybe there's a rock under which I could sort of find a, one one paper from that file, or um, I'm just refused to take notes for an answer. So I wrote a, a, a ton of letters and met with a lot of uh, espionage historians, and um, and and then uh, and and I wrote to you and I spoke with you about this as well. And and I just I felt um, that that it was it must be possible to find um, somewhere. And I I got basically. Um, I, that that whole search um, led me to I, I, first of all it, it introduced me to a lot of phenomenal historians um, who were able to answer other questions that I had, um, including a Moscow-based historian who uh, assisted me in in um, obtaining other archival documents that that were extremely difficult to find um, that were sort of peripherally about uh, espionage, and. Um, and then I also wrote uh, a letter to the to the embassy, um, um, the Russian embassy, and, and introduced myself as Mildred Harnock's great great niece, and uh, pled my case. And they actually sent me a, a, just a little snippet. So uh, that was it was a it was a great day when I when I received that, mm -hmm. as well as a photograph. And that is actually in my book. There is a photograph of Mildred and Arvid. Uh, from the early 30s, and this was when it was so illuminating, and it really did um, corroborate something that I already knew, which was that Soviet intelligence had their eye on both of them far before they knew. Uh, and and so in the early 30s, they were both involved, and particularly Arvid in a group called Arplan. And it was, uh, I, I won't go into it too much because I know that our time is limited, but you can read about it in my book. And it essentially was a was a society, sort of a, a discussion group um, uh, composed of economists and artists and and journalists and um, and academics, and and they met to discuss the state of of Germany and and the state of the economy, and um, and the idea was to maybe import some ideas from the Soviet Union. And Arvid was the secretary of this group, and. And this was when he came under the um, uh, the surveillance, really, of, of Soviet espionage. They began to think, um, and Arvid was not the only one, but this was one of the. It was a so-called friendship society, and the Soviets did this. Uh, they played the long game, so they so they basically looked out for people who they wanted to potentially recruit down the line. Um, and so this this uh, this photograph um, of both of them was from that time. Fascinating. Yeah, I want to talk a little more about the, the kinds of textual evidence that you incorporate in the book, um, but you have a lot of um, reproductions of some of the snippets of some of the documents that you found. Yes. Um, and you also do things like, um, you know, there's a place where you describe um, in quite uh, elegant and, you know, comprehensive detail an invitation that was sent out for one of Mildred's lectures, right? You say the invitations are embossed on stationery, the color of cream, an elegant script. Um, and you, so, you know, many biographers choose not to include this kind of thing, right? Um, or they include it in, you know, we could say in processed form as part of the narration, right? We, we don't, the biographer looks at the invitation in the archive and takes from it the relevant data, you know, that such and such a person delivered such and such a lecture on a certain day and doesn't include, you know, the more atmospheric details, all that gets sort of left behind in the archive. Um, and, you know, I had my own sense when I was writing my book about Shirley Jackson that some of, some of the best stories are the ones that we feel like we need to leave behind for some reason or other. But I was really struck that you chose to, um, keep some of that unprocessed information in your book. And I would love to hear more about your thought process behind that. Well, yes, I felt it's so interesting that you bring up that particular invitation because I, I, I remember um, often when I came across these documents, I 
I had that. I, I was so, I loved touching them. I just, I, there was something that just the, the, um, the tactile aspect of doing the research for this book was, was, uh, was something that I really enjoyed. And, and I developed my narrative strategy in, in those early days when I was, you know, sort of touching all these documents and looking at these invitations and not, and, um, and also uh, declassified uh, files um, in US intelligence and, and also uh, in, in London at the National Archives. And I, looking at these photographs um, behind a plastic sleeve and, and just thinking who held this and, and, and how many people held this piece of paper and what did they look like and what did the paper smell like? And so I had all of these thoughts and I thought, you know, I think that readers need to actually experience some of this. So when I described the cream colored um, invitation, that was that that's kind of where that it came from that uh, those those kinds of thoughts and then i thought now do i include a picture of it i mean it's a sort of a minor moment uh, in, in, certainly um in this book and when when we think of a conventional biography we think about that middle insert where we have the photographs and and that's an opportunity to show really to showcase your primary photographs and documents well it didn't quite belong in there and so I had to, I started making these decisions. Well, I'm not going to reproduce that. I'll just describe it vividly. So the, so the reader can really get a sense of it. A reader can get a sense of receiving it. Because I already, already I was also sort of describing not only Mildred uh, who was giving the lecture, but also the people who would receive that invitation. And that tells us something about the composition of the room and the people who are connected with the resistance. And so it all is storytelling. Um, it's not just decoration. Um, it's a, a, and a, a pretty lyrical um, phrase, but and in that case, I decided not to reproduce um, uh, the invitation. But in other cases, I would, and I just flipped over into my book right now, and I, I would, I would reproduce documents like this. This is one of my favorite lining. This is one of my favorite archival discoveries, and this is in this chapter called Kasibur, and this is a, basically is a, means a sort of a, a note, a secret note. And this was a note that one of uh, Mildred's co-conspirators who was incarcerated, this is after they were all arrested by the Gestapo um, in late uh, 1942. And in case, anybody, Gestapo, yeah. in case anybody has a copy of the book, Candy, maybe you just wanna say what page you're looking at. Oh yes, um, what page is that? page 403. And so, and so you see, I, I don't know if this is coming through in the camera, but you, you see this cramped writing. Now these were notes, this is one example of them, uh, but some of them were large uh, and some of them were little teeny shreds of paper. Uh, this was the way that Mildred and her co-conspirators communicated in prison. They were, they were prohibited to talk with one another. Um, and and yet they found themselves after they were arrested and thrown into Gestapo headquarters. And then uh, over the course of three and a half months the, the, basically the, the, the women were sent to women's prisons and the men were sent to men's prisons because it filled to capacity with people in the resistance. And they were all preparing for a mass trial. Um, I alluded to this um, uh, or introduced this idea in the introduction, the Reichskriegsgericht, which is the Reich Court Martial. It was a military court. And this was a mass treason trial, top secret. And they were conducting uh, interrogations over the course of this three and a half months uh, to try to basically shake down um, the prisoners and discover who else was in their network. Mildred was tortured, um, as were others. and. Um, and, and so the Kassiber were, was, was one way of sharing information. So-and-so said this to an interrogator, don't say this, this is, and, and ways that uh, people could warn each other about sympathetic prison guards or unsympathetic prison guards. Um, sometimes there were these little prose poems just about the, the, fall, the way the light uh, fell onto a cinder block. Um, and they just, some of these just took my breath away. Um, the, the poetry uh, in these notes. Um, there were uh, little diary entries and they were written by prisoners who of course uh, would then, some, some of them would uh, crumple them up and stick them into the cracks and fissures of the prison wall. Sometimes they would pass them as they, there was one walk that they would take uh, around the prison yard uh, daily, a very short one. And, um, 
and, and then sometimes they would hide them in the hems of their garments. Um, one way that the, the Nazi prison officials would try to save money for their prison was to require the family members of the imprisoned to do their laundry, which became an excellent way of passing notes. So they would, <laughs> so, so that those who were imprisoned would then uh, basically, that they would get smuggled back and forth. And, and this is the reason why we have these notes because some of the family members did save them. Um, and so, so going back to this, this is an example of one. And, and, and uh, what was particularly astonishing about this was the woman who's writing this is saying, is uh, revealing who betrayed Mildred to the Gestapo interrogators while incarcerated. Um, and um, there was a woman, Libertas schultz Boysen, who is often celebrated as a, a heroine of the resistance in this group, but she actually betrayed um, dozens of people and um, sent them to their deaths in an effort to save her own skin. Um, and and the, the writer of this, uh, Kassiber, calls her lips um, in, in German. So it's sort of a, a, a pun on libs, libertas, lips, um, she was talking. Um, and, uh, uh, telling secrets and giving people up. Um, and a, several of the people, or a number of people who uh, had not been, who had escaped Gestapo notice, um, she named uh, and th they wouldn't have been arrested had it not been for her. Um, and one of these people was Hans, Hans and Hilda Koppi who uh, were rounded up and, um, and Hilda was present, quite pregnant. She gave birth in prison and her child and then after that, she was executed um, several months later. And her child, Hans Koppi Jr., uh, became the, went on to grow up and dedicate his life to the study of the resistance. And, um, and he was the director of the Red Orchestra Collection, uh, which is a name of this group. It's a, sort of a misnomer, which I can discuss, but um, at the Gedenkstätte Deutsche Widerstand, the German Resistance Memorial Center. So I met him too, um, and he was an incredible source for me. Um, uh, for material, and um, and he helped me fill in some of these gaps as well. You uncovered so many of these fascinating documents, and so again, as a biographer, one thing that really intrigued me was, you know, all biographers obviously deal with the question of determining which sources are telling the truth, or you know, how literally one can interpret somebody's letters. You know, what we write to our mother is not the same thing as we write to our lover and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but for you, there is an additional challenge because in so many of these cases, Mildred was actually writing to people in code. Yes. Um, like, for, for instance, you talk, talk about, um, you know, you have on, on the one hand, she's writing to her mother and she says things like, don't worry about us at all, which seems very benign. And you read into that, you know, she, oh, she says, we're not active politically. And you say, well, this is absolutely untrue. You know, she's just trying to protect her mother. Um, but then as, as things progress, she's actually um, using code words um, or expressions, um, you know, that you, you must have had some way of figuring this out. How did you, how did you manage this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some of this was, you know, I, I was very, very careful in this book um, to advance claims about how Mildred may have felt unless I had a primary source document uh, that revealed this. Um, and, and the same goes for what she thought or what she meant. Um, so I, I definitely, um, you know, I used, in some cases, I luckily some memoirs, um, some people, uh, Part of the extended family, the, the Harnocks, the Bonhoeffers, the, the Delbrooks and the Dochnanyis, this is the, the four families that, that intermarried and, um, and the women, uh, and, and they also were involved, many members of, of this group, of this family clan um, were involved in the resistance and several of them, um, a number of them were involved in the 1944 Valkyrie plot to assassinate Hitler. And, um, the wives survived uh, and wrote about this in, 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 um, in memoirs. And so they wrote about the codes. And so I was able to, in reading about the codes that they used, I was able to sort of uh, connect the dots and, and, and look at Mildred's letters and, and see what, um, what she may have meant. And 
And one of them was to, whenever there was a profound emotion about something, it usually meant that the opposite of the emotion is what she felt. So if she's really happy about something and, she, and it was always very cartoonish how she would describe it in her letter. It, it, it was, because otherwise her letters were, were just tonally different. Um, but when there was a sort of a really bright spot and she would describe this huge emotion, you know, in 1936, you'd write in the, you know, when, when Germany was very much a fascist dictatorship, uh, I, she tended to mean the opposite thing. And, and so, um, and then there are expressions like she's in the hospital and one of the family members described what that meant, which, it, which meant you've been arrested. Um, and so there were these kinds of things, right? And often my, you know, my strategy for filling in these gaps, going back to that question, Ruth, is that I didn't always, um, I, there are gaps in, in the letters. Uh, I didn't have every letter um, that Mildred sent her family um, and uh, because family members did burn them and I can talk about that too. But, uh, and so I, I was aware of the gaps, but so in my strategy and, and Mildred burned her diary as well. So, so what do you do when faced as a biographer with the, with the, with the notion that, that you have these gaps? Well, you look at this person for, and you have a sort of prismatic perspective and you look at this person from, from this person's perspective and this person's and this person's. And, and I did that both in the prison uh, chapters when I had those Kassibur and I was able to, to find out what these women were doing. Uh, they, a lot of them told in great detail their daily activities, what they ate, what they did, uh, the forced labor um, activities at a time when Mildred was in solitary confinement and wasn't allowed to, to read, write, or talk to anybody. So I used their stories to kind of cast a shed light on what was happening to her by implication. Um, and uh, until the point when I had two letters by a, a cellmate who was given to her after those three and a half months, um, to, given to her, uh, basically shoved into her cell um, to prevent her from committing suicide. Uh, and um, and and that woman gave wrote two letters and that woman survived and so I was able to learn more specifically about her prison life but um, but basically yes so it, going back to the code I would use other other sources to shed light uh, for myself on um, you know the codes that Mildred used and what she could have meant. Really, really interesting. Um, I just want to remind. And our participants that Re Rebecca will take questions at the end of our session. So if anybody, um, I see we have a couple questions already, but if anybody else wants to put questions in the chat um, or to send them directly to me, I invite you to do that now. Um, I'll just carry on because I have lots and lots of questions. Sure. <laughs> <in the meantime. laughs> um, but yeah, so there are, I wonder, if you see, um, you know, number one, were there books that you were thinking about as models as you followed your journey um, to creating this book? And number two, if there, if you see the approach that you eventually chose to take as somehow emblematic of larger trends in contemporary biography writing? Well, I, you know, I read widely and deeply um, and in preparing to write this book and all through over the course of the writing of this book. Um, I read biographies, I read memoirs, I read, um, I even read novels about this period. And, and, um, and, uh, and of course, I went through all of um, the traditional accounts, the history books, uh, William Shearer's Rise and Fall of the Third Reich was, was a source. Um, and Anthony Beaver was a source and, mm -hmm. and um, Richard Evans was a source. And, uh, and so I, I, you know, I had I, it's sort of the traditional nonfiction uh, historical accounts, um, narrative nonfiction accounts, um, fictional accounts and, um, and biographical accounts. And, and was trying to, uh, again, I had the sense uh, that, I, that I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to do a cradle to grave. Uh, biography. I didn't want to take an orthodox approach, uh, um, and I I felt that I needed to bring something new to the story as her great great niece, and also do something with the new information and documents that had emerged 
um, in the in the 20 years of that since her first biography was published. So, um, so uh, of of all of these books, I have to the the one that just just hit me over the head was Anne Carson's Knox. You know, and Anne Carson is this polymath poet, um, and and so it was an unconventional, you might say, a book uh, that would inspire somebody who's writing a biography. But but th this book was uh, uh, first of all that the presentation of the book. Um, I feel like I I have it over there, but but it's not show and tell. You can just um, imagine for yourselves. Uh, it, it opens like an accordion, and and you see a lot of documents here and there. And so already, just the, the process of turning the page is different, um, and and it's a it's a much more sort of tactile process. And and then you see, and what the what the book is is a it can be considered a wonderfully inventive biography uh, about her brother who committed suicide. So. When why did he commit suicide? It was a mystery and there were so many gaps. And so Ann Carson conceived of this book as a kind of epitaph and incorporated bits of poetry and scraps of letters and quotations. And, and, and so I, I, I began to think about engaging the reader of my biography as a sort of walking alongside me as I researched the archives, the archives and tracked archives. down sources and as I filled in gaps and, and so um, as a, and this is when I started thinking of it as being kind of like a scholarly detective story. Um, and so, uh, and, and then I wanted, and I wanted to present evidence and that led to the idea of, of, sort of having this scrapbook book approach and incorporating these documents. And, and also I, I really embraced this idea and I saw how successful it could be to embrace the idea of the gaps and to allow, you know, if there is no historical record if it, if it, if it has, if whatever that document was, uh, has been destroyed by a family member or by the Nazis, that you allow the gaps to show you like a good piece, piece of music, you allow the silences to resonate. And, you know, there, there's meaning in those gaps and there's meaning in those silences and beauty too. That's really beautifully put. Um, okay, so here we we have a couple of questions. Um, somebody's wondering if Mildred grew up in a German speaking household. I'm so um, glad what somebody first set her down, yeah. down, this, down her academic yeah. and personal path. So glad you asked that. This is one of those errors that I encounter over and over again that's sort of out there. Um, it was on Wikipedia for a while. Mildred is, is and it's actually in an I think it's still on Wikipedia. I keep on trying to correct it and then it doesn't get corrected. It's in articles that are online that Mildred was either a German slash American or that, and that she grew up speaking, reading um, and writing German, which is just complete hogwash. Um, she did not. Um, she uh, most definitely was a, an English speech speaker and uh, in school, a poor student of French. Um, uh, and, uh, and I saw her report cards and so I was able to verify this. She, um, she, she had an impoverished childhood and she basically moved around every year when her father couldn't pay the rent um, and from one boarding house to another. And, um, and, but there is this, I think there's an effort and it's an understandable uh, um, Sort of inaccuracy because I think people want to understand why did she do this? Why did if she must have had some allegiance to Germany in her childhood for her? This is the this is the thought for her to then go to Germany and then risk her life and stay in Germany when she could have very well left and she had the opportunity um, as late as uh, well in 1937 when she went back to the United States to visit her family and her mother was dying and her family. Or basically begged her to stay, and she said, "I have to go back." Um, and when she was caught by the Gestapo in her purse, there was a, a, a ticket that her husband had actually bought. He begged her to leave too. Um, Arvid bought a ticket, a, a one-way ticket for her to cross the Atlantic and go back to the United States. And she didn't use she didn't use that ticket. It was it was among her possessions um, uh, at, that were listed on her the, the questionnaire at Plotensy Prison, but. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think that that um, and she she developed and uh, she certainly loved, became enamored of German uh, literature through Arvid. They read she read him Whitman. 
she read her Goethe. They would go on these picnics and walks in the mountains. And, and it was really this cross-cultural exchange um, um, and this profound love that they had for one another. But, but she didn't, you know, Milwaukee certainly had a lot of Germans um, in it, but, but this was not at all a part of, of, of her culture growing up in her household. Fascinating. Um, all right. What? Uh, so, why was um, Harnack's U.S. citizenship? Uh, why wasn't that sufficient to protect her? And why did Hitler specifically want her to be executed? Um, well, I can, I'll start by answering the second part of that question. I, why did Why did he want her executed? Now, um, for those who who aren't familiar with the story, she there was one at the first treason trial, she was given a six year prison sentence um, at a work camp. And then two days later, Hitler found out about this and basically reversed the decision and ordered a retrial and, and, um, and where she was declared um, guilty and, and given a death sentence. Um, I, I, this, was, this was unusual. Um, and, I, and so the question remains why we don't have any, documentation of this. I, I have documentation of basically Hitler saying, no, um, I don't accept this um, uh, when she got the prison sentence, but we don't know why. Um, the Nazis did destroy the, the, the transcripts of that trial. We have the sentencing documents, but we don't have the transcripts and we don't have anybody taking notes um, when, uh, when he was sort of reading over um, the, you know, the, the trial decisions and declaring that this has to, um, this cannot be. So um, Falk Harnock, uh, her brother-in-law speculated, he was a survivor. He was a member of the Weisse Rosa, the White Rose Resistance Group. And he speculated after the war that maybe it, it was because she was an American um, and he was so angry uh, that he wanted to, uh, to send a message um, that's entirely possible. I mean, he was aghast that, that there was this American in full perhaps, but this is conjecture. I, I simply don't know. Um, so we can only conjecture. She was the only American woman in that group. Um, there was one man who was uh, um, born in Detroit, but uh, had moved to Germany when he was very, very young. And, um, uh, and he committed suicide actually uh, when he found out that he would be interrogated um, by Walter Habecker, who was this sadistic Nazi who interrogated um, Mildred and Arvid, uh, but he, he committed suicide. So he was, he did not um, uh, end up going to trial. Um, uh, what was the second part of the question? What about other, what about some of the others who were in the group, including her husband, what happened to them? What, what, what sorry, what, what about others? What about, what about the others? What was the, what was the fate of some of the others in her group? In was, her oh, okay, resistance? almost, yeah, her almost heart. all of them. Uh, so, so there was this sort of, you know, the, the appearance of, of due process and, uh, but uh, in this trial, but it was just, um, you know, quite frankly, a joke. Um, uh, two pieces of evidence had to be um, brought forth against the accused in order to give, uh, to, to declare that person guilty of treason. Um, and the evidence uh, was basically obtained through torture um, and, uh, and, and it was very easy for uh, basically the, the chief prosecutor to declare nearly everybody guilty. And the panel of judges who uh, presided over these proceedings um, did give the death sentence to, to nearly everybody. The, the men uh, that were either hanged or shot, um, if Arvid Harnock, Mildred's husband was hanged, um, Harold Schulze Boysen uh, was hanged. Um, and, and they were regarded as, as you know, the, some of the, the, uh, the worst offenders. And so um, they were actually hanged from meat hooks. It's very gruesome um, at Plutensy Prison. In the same room, there was a guillotine brought in. Um, I, I devote a whole chapter to where that guillotine came from. I, thought, I felt it was very important for people to understand and understand with a clear, it's sort of, uh, not avert their gaze, but understand what what the instrument of their death was and how it was made and and uh, uh, and by whom and how it came to be there. Um, so I trace the history of this guillotine, um, and uh, and it tells us a lot about the Nazi regime also because it it 
it was made in the late 1800s and fell into disrepair and wasn't even used because it, uh, there was no need to decapitate people for a long time until Hitler became chancellor. And then it was brought over to Plotensee prison. So the women um, were by and large decapitated. And, um, and then the women were following, right. that, sorry? Oh, did you say something? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, and then the women following their, their beheading um, were actually, uh, their bodies were given to a um, Hermann Steva, who was the head of anatomy at the University of Berlin, who had a special arrangement with Plumsey Prison uh, director to have a fresh supply of women's bodies uh, for his research in, uh, into the, acute, the effects of acute stress on the menstrual cycle. Um, and reproductive organs. And the, uh, the microscopic remains of these women were actually, some of these women, some of Mildred's co-conspirators who were um, desecrated in this way, were just discovered um, recently. And there's an article, uh, for those of you who are interested, um, was published in The Guardian in, in 2019, and it was also picked up by The New York Times. And they were given a proper burial, basically, um, in 2019. So, um, so, so, yeah. Um, in some, pretty much everybody was was executed. There are a few exceptions, and uh, those who uh, were the exceptions went on to write memoirs, which is why we have a, a better understanding of the story. Greta Kukov, um, uh, Gunter Weissenborn are among them. So we're reaching the end of our uh, time, but I just want to ask one last question, which has popped up a couple of times. Which is, what is your sense of the utility of Mildred, Mildred Harnack's espionage. Did, did she do damage to Nazi Germany? Um, you know, what was, what, were, what was the ultimate impact or effect of it? Ah, well, um, you know, this is something that was debated after, after the war. Germans were sort of hotly divided on the subject, whether the group as a whole, um, not just Mildred, uh, either uh, damaged the, um, Hitler's regime and damaged the, the, the German, uh, basically led to their um, defeat or whether um, they, or whether they had very little effect. And, um, and I, I think, um, and, and it's a question that still, that, that persists uh, even to this day. But I think, I think it's important to, from my perspective, I think it's pretty clear that the groups, you know, Yes, they engaged in espionage. Uh, Mildred engaged in espionage uh, for the Allies, so for the United States as well, and as, as also for um, past information to the Soviet Union. But but their group and others never really posed a serious threat to Hitler's rule. Um, and it's clear uh, that Stalin um, ignored their warnings, many warnings. Arvid, and, Arvid Harnack and Harald Schulze Boysen compiled, uh, basically gave uh, over a period of six months prior to um, Barbarossa, uh, a, just a wealth of information about um, letting uh, Stalin know that Hitler was just about to invade um, the Soviet Union and Stalin ignored it all. And in fact, in my book, uh, one of the documents that, that I present uh, a, a photograph of is the actual uh, report with Stalin's handwriting scrawled across it. Uh, and it's, it's in a chapter called Stalin's Obscenity because what he scrawled across that report was an obscenity, which of course I cannot repeat here, but basically uh, he uh, said that the people who, the Germans who provided this information um, could do something to their mothers, uh, and that's that was what he said, and um, and so he refused to believe um, their warnings. And um, you know, had he believed them, then maybe the answer would have been yes, uh, because Mildred was involved in enciphering and helping deliver um, these sort of these codes, send these coded messages to the Soviet Union. Had he heeded their warnings, um, maybe maybe the answer would be different. That that they did indeed help. Um, um, uh, the allies win the war, but, but um, I can't say that they did. And I should also just point out that Mildred and Arvid never thought of themselves as professional spies. And, and that's something that should be really emphasized. And um, some accounts don't, um, early German accounts don't really um, 
don't really make this point. Um, they, they were uh, primarily, first and always, members of the resistance. And to the extent that, that engaging in espionage could assist in their efforts to defeat the Nazi regime, yes, they would participate. And um, Arvid said as much to his control officer, and, and we have documentation of this. Um, and, and his control officer was very frustrated that he couldn't control Arvid and, um, and, and that Arvid had, had a mind of his own, um, as did Mildred, so. Well, so we are unfortunately out of time. Um, this conversation was so fascinating. I noticed, I encourage all of you to pick up a copy of this book. If you haven't already, uh, there are a few questions in the chat that we didn't have time to get to yet. And um, Rebecca is on social media, on Twitter, I think elsewhere, and I'm sure would be um, happy to engage with anybody who wants to reach out um, by those means. Uh, Rebecca, is there anything you would like to say uh, just in conclusion? Uh, I just, I just, I think I would love to thank you, Ruth. Um, the, I, I loved uh, you. You're a wonderful interlocutor, and I and I, I loved your questions, and I thought this was a really fascinating discussion. I love talking about process, um, and I think that, um, and I also just want to thank everybody uh, who came to uh, join in this um, discussion. Um, and uh, yes, I, I urge you to, to get a copy of the book. Um, email me if you would like to communicate with me. Uh, right now the book is sold out at Amazon, has been sold out since the second day of pub date um, at Amazon and, and Powell's. And, um, and uh, so as, as Kai Bird who mentioned at the beginning of this talk, go on to bookshop.com and find your local indie, which is best anyway, um, if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book uh, before the second printing uh, lands. Um, there's going to be a, a little bit of a waiting time. So uh, definitely that's how you can obtain a copy of the book. Um, and, uh, and thank you that to, um, to you all. Wonderful. Thank you, Kai and the Levy Center. Yes. And thank you, Kai. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Ruth.